Good morning. How's everybody feeling? An hour deprived of sleep, stolen from you, only to be given back later on in the year. Um, okay, so we're in a series called the Emo Church, which is uh, a church on be- uh, a series on becoming an emotionally healthy church. And the the, the thesis for this entire series, uh, we say this almost every week, is this: uh, it is not possible for a Christian. Uh, to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. This is our thesis for the entire series. It's impossible, it's not possible for a Christian to be spiritually mature, to have you think you have it down spiritually. And remember from our annual vision and prayer, our desire is to be mature. We're four years old, it's time to grow up a little bit, and I think one of the ways that we need to do that is emotionally. Um, But it's impossible for us to have all the Bible verses memorized and be in a small group and all this other stuff and remain emotionally immature. And I hope that that sentence right there makes more sense as we are almost, ha- we're more than halfway done with this series now. How it's important that we break the power of the past as we talked about several weeks ago. That we go back and heal lest all we're doing in Christian life is subconsciously protecting ourselves from whatever happened in our past from happening again. And so if we were young or when we had a relationship that went sour or something bad happened to us, all we're really doing if we don't go back and deal with that thing is we're trying to protect ourselves from that happening again. And so every relationship we try to control or people please or do whatever to control that thing so whatever happened to us then doesn't happen to us again. And it's important that we go back and break the power of the past. It's also important that we live in vulnerability. Um, as people who the promise of the New Testament is that we are given hearts of flesh and it's okay to feel, it's okay to be emotional and to be spiritual means you feel things deeply. You don't just float through life not affected really by anything that happens and a lot of times that's what spirituality is. It's like this, you're floating through life and nothing really affects you that much but that's not true spirituality. The promise of of the gospel is that we are given hearts that feel We are given hearts of flesh that can know God and know ourselves and know others. And it's important that we receive the gift of limits, that we are not, we can't just do anything we want to, but it's important that we live underneath the limits that God has placed in our lives and be free there and flourish there because that's what true freedom is. I would even argue that's where true creativity happens when there's clearly defined limits. And today I would like to talk about embracing grief and loss. Embracing grief and loss, and I have not been looking forward to this, this sermon from the very beginning. I say that every week, but this is for real this time. For real. Next week is going to be awesome, whatever, okay? Incarnation, yes, all right? But this week, oh my gosh, um, this week's hard. And the reason why it's hard is, well, I tried to pass it off for one, I'll be honest with you. Um, we were doing this sermon schedule, I'm like, who wants to do that one? We think you should do that one. I'm like, I don't think I should do that one. Um, And then I said, how about we team teach? We'll, like, all teach it together. And they're like, yeah, yeah, but they never got back to me. So (laughs) here I am. Um, So I want to talk about embracing grief and loss in our lives. And so with that, turn to Genesis chapter 3 and let me pray. God, we... We want to to show up and receive the thing that you have for us, to receive from you what you have planned for your church, uh, Reality San Francisco, uh, this day, today, March 9th, 2014. What do you have for us today? And we want to live into that, Lord. We want to receive that with open arms and open hands, open hearts and open minds, God. And so we bring all of ourselves here this morning. All of our mental capacity and physical capacity and emotional capacity, we bring it all to you and we say, would you speak to us now? And would you lead us into a place where we can respond to you in a healthy manner? That we can completely open our hearts to you and say, this is what we deal with. This is the, the, the loss that we need to grieve in our lives. I know some of us are very afraid of that. And it's understandable, God. Loss is so painful. But I pray, God, that this would be a safe place. That you would hide us under the shadow of your wings. That as we grieve and as we look at our losses, we know that, that God, you rejoice over us with singing. That you are for us and you are with us, God. You are here today. 
And as I confessed earlier to the worship team, Lord, I don't really know how to orchestrate this whole thing. I don't know how to take us to where we need to go, but I trust your spirit does. Your spirit, God, knows where to take this service. And so uh, I, along with the rest of this church, am here just wanting to know what you want to do. And so, God, would you lead us now? Submit everything I have, every capacity I have to you and say, I need your help. And would you anoint me, Lord? We need your hope, Jesus. We pray for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. A while ago, um, I was asked by a spiritual advisor. They asked me this question. This person asked me this question. Have you, Dave, have you grieved? Have you grieved? It was a time in my life where there were parts of my life, both professionally and personally, that were excelling, that were advancing, that were going forward, and I was really excited about in my life. But there was also parts of my life, both professionally and personally, that were dying and that were stagnant. And so I was caught in this, I couldn't reconcile the two. I was stuck in this weird in-between part where like part of me like, I want to keep moving forward and I want to keep advancing. But then I feel like I'm dragging all this other stuff with me and I'm stuck. And I got got in this place of being stuck and getting in this place of depression. How did I, how was I supposed to, was I supposed to drag the dead and broken pieces along full steam ahead? Or do I just stop and deny moving forward? So like, I can't move forward anymore. I'm, I'm no longer allowed to move forward until, like, I'm just going to live in the dead pieces here. And I didn't know how to reconcile these two things. There was so much heartbreak in my life. There's so many things that happened in my life that just hurt. But then I had all this bright future ahead of me. What am I, how do I reconcile these two things? And, the, and this, this person said, well, have you grieved And I'm like, grieved? Well, no one died. What do you mean grieved? I haven't grieved because no one's died. No one close to me. It's not like someone died. I I don't know. What do you mean grieved? They said, but have you grieved? And this is the sentence that I'll never forget. Have you grieved the loss of what you had hoped for in this life? Have you grieved the loss for what you had hoped for in this life? And that phrase stuck out because I didn't know that was an option. Have you grieved what you had hoped for? You had hoped for all of these things in your personal life and in your professional life and in the church and in the ministry and all these other things. And have you grieved that those things have not happened and might not ever happen? And this is the two things that I couldn't reconcile. How do I move forward? And the answer was, have you grieved? Remember last week, we looked at Genesis 3, and we asked the question, why the tree? Why was this tree there? Why did God put this tree there, the knowledge of good and evil tree? Genesis 3, after Adam and Eve ate from the tree, and their eyes were opened, and they realized they were naked, and they hid from God, and God came in, and like, where were you? And while we ate the tree that that you you said not to eat, and we realized that we were naked, and that that whole thing happens in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis, Genesis chapter 3 is called the fall. Now, if you're, if you're new to the Christian faith, let me give you really quick, this actually might be helpful for everyone, but this is review for most. This is the story arc of the Bible. This is how the Bible is, is story arc. From Genesis to Revelation, this is the story arc. It goes creation, Genesis 1 and 2. Fall, Genesis chapter 3, all the way through Revelation chapter like 20. Okay? So it's like fall the whole thing. But then you have redemption that breaks in and continues to break in all throughout from Genesis chapter 3 on. Redemption also breaks in and then ultimately breaks in in Jesus Christ. But then you have fall and redemption living together until one day there will be a restoration of all things and everything is recreated. So you could actually say restoration is recreation. So it's creation, fall, redemption, recreation or creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Now the creation part is what we talked about last week. It's Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. This is perfect. Everything was perfect. Everything was in its proper place. Everything was in harmony. And I go back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2 a lot in this church. Because I think it's, it's really bad when, when you come to church and you think the first thing you hear is that you're, you're a sinner and you're, you're, you're destined for hell. Like that's where the Christian story starts. And that's not where the Christian story starts. The Christian story starts in Genesis 1 and 2 that God created us, he made us, perfection, we lived in harmony with him. That's where the Bible starts. 
So creation happens. Creation, everything's perfect. Humanity was born into this world. We were created for this world. We were created for perfection. Our bodies, our souls, our emotions are all built for perfection. Your body, your soul, your emotions were built for perfection. Now think about that for a second. You were built for perfection. I was talking to my niece yesterday about being in high school now. She's a freshman in the East Bay. And how she, how she was liking it. And she said that it was okay. And she had a list of things she liked and didn't like. And then she got around to like the things she didn't like and the things going on in the school with students and the teachers and so on and so forth. And then she said this. And this moment of like, this is, this is just what I hope. She said, I just wish people would care about each other more. I wish that the students would care about the teachers, the teachers would care about the students, and the students would care about each other. And then she tells the story of this bloody fight that happened in one of the classrooms. She goes, I just wish they cared more. I wish that everyone cared about each other more. And I knew exactly what she meant. You know what this is? What this is and what my niece has is before the world teaches you kill or be killed, there's this longing we all have for perfect harmony. Every single human soul has a longing for perfect harmony. I think of the turmoil in our city currently with the affordable housing and gentrification in the tech industry. And when sage words pierce through all the shouting, what we all really want to know is this. Can we all just coexist? Can we have it all in the city? A city where working class families can afford their homes and raise their kids in the city with all this influx of new affluent communities moving in. Can we all just care about each other? We want it all. And the reason why we want it all in San Francisco, the reason why we want it all in our schools, the reason why we want it all in our relationships, the reason why we want it all in our lives is that deep down in the human psyche, every single human has a memory of Genesis chapter 2. Every single one of you who has ever wanted peace between a family member and you or a relationship in you and job in you or a school in you or a city in you or the world, like world peace, every single human that has wanted peace has this collective memory of Genesis chapter 2. We all remember where, where it was in harmony or perfect or shalom. But because of the fall, look at what was lost. Here's the effects of the fall. And if you read Genesis chapter 3, if you read from verses uh, 6 all the way down to the end of the chapter, you get a list of everything that happens as a result of the fall. And here's the results. Naked and ashamed, so we hide. Genesis 3.16. We're naked and ashamed, and so we hide out of our shame, or we blame out of our shame. God goes up to Adam, like, what happened? Like, well, the, the woman that you gave me. Like, you made her. I didn't make her. Like, I went to sleep, and then bam, she was there. That's on you, not me. She saw the fruit. She ate it. She gave me some. I mean, she was beautiful. What am I going to say? No to her? Like, no way. Blames her, and then Eve blames the serpent. That serpent, why did you create the serpent? Why did you create the tree? Like, what's going on here? Blame happens. The other thing that's lost is it says there, God said there will be pain in childbearing, very severe pain in childbearing. And if you read the rest of the narrative in the Bible, you also know there's pain in child rearing as well. There is pain in raising a child. There is pain in conceiving a child. Later on, you get to Elizabeth, who can't have a child, and then God gives her a child, John the Baptist, and she says, I am pregnant now. My shame is gone away. There's this connection between not being able to have children and shame in the Bible. Because of the fall, that's taken away too. There's pain in, child, in childbearing, there's pain in raising your child, and there's pain when you can't have a child. There's intermarital conflict in Genesis 3.16 where the women and the men, will, the desire will be him, for, him to rule over you and you will, your desire will be for him. And there's this conflict that happens in marriage. And Ephesians 5 is the undoing of this conflict, but it's still there. Then you have work. It's painful labor. Work. I know a lot of you love your jobs. But work is toil. Work is painful. 
everything that we do and work will cost us something. And some companies say it'll cost you your family. Some companies say it'll cost you your life. Some companies say it'll cost you your time and your extracurricular activities. Some companies say it'll cost you your health. Work will cost you something. It does not come for free. It does not come easy. And then it says life will be a fight for food and shelter until one day you lose it and return to the ground in death. You will fight the ground for work and you will, you will labor and toil to build shelter and to get food and, and then one day you'll lose the battle against the ground. You, you, you'll lose the battle against work and toil and you'll lose it and you'll die and you'll be buried right back into the ground where you came from. This is the result of the fall. Because of the fall, we were built for perfection, but we live in this. We were created for perfection, but we lost it. You and I were created for perfection, but we lost it. We are hardwired for a world of love, complete, perfect love. We were hardwired for trust. We were hardwired for care. We were hardwired for peace. But that's not the world we live in. Therefore, we were born into a world of disappointment. Think about this. You were born into a world of disappointment. Disappointment is inevitable. You were created for perfection. You were born in a world of imperfection with an imperfect body. And so you are bound to be disappointed. Now back to the question that I was asked by my spiritual advisor. Have you grieved the loss of what you had hoped for in this life? Why do I need to grieve the loss of what I had hoped for? Because you were born into a world of disappointment. And you have all these dreams and these hopes and they keep letting you down and they don't happen over and over and over again and they pile on you and then in, in the book that we're reading together in community group he says they, they weigh in our souls like rocks and they keep weighing in us and every disappointment weighs us down and every disappointment weighs us down and we, we, buy, we go to this new job and it disappoints us I mean it's great but it just disappoints us we buy that, that new whatever it is we're like that thing when I get that thing oh my gosh all my, all my worries will go away once I get that perfect pair of raw denim and everything will be better and you get it like, it's so disappointing. They didn't do what I, they didn't like, they don't look the way I thought they'd look in my head. We go and we date that, perf, that person, or we don't date them, or whatever, and we're disappointed. Even the more like stuff that people don't like to admit, you get married. And marriage is disappointing because it wasn't what you thought in your head. Because most of us are looking for buddies to marry. Most of us are like, I, I want to marry someone who's like my buddy, my friend, and we do all the same things together. And we forget that two people that are like, like opposites come together. This is not a teaching on marriage, so I won't even start. But <laughs> anyway, and we dis- we're disappointed in that. And we're like, we're created for perfection. We have a way that everything is supposed to go, but we live in a world of disappointment. Now, what do you do with the disappointment? Now, what do I do with the disappointment? Do, do I stop wishing for a perfect world? Do I just go, I'm going to stop wishing then. I'm going to stop dreaming. A de- the, death, the death of my dreams. I'm going to start hoping for perfection in relationships. I'm going to stop hoping for, for peace and shalom. I'm going to stop all that stuff. I'm going to live in the real world. And it's a broken world. Is that what I do? Do I stop dreaming? Do I stop hoping? Do I lower my expectations so much that I don't expect anything from anyone? So that when an ounce of good comes through, I'm completely surprised? Some of you guys do that. Like, I don't expect anything from anyone. And then when someone texts me, I'm like, oh my gosh, (laughs) look at that. I got a text. Huh. Oh well. Like, is that what we do? We just kind of lower our expectations so much so that we kind of go through life going, no, we don't do any of that. We don't stop dreaming. We don't start hoping for a perfect world. We don't lower our, our expectations. What we do is we grieve. We must grieve we must be people who keep hoping and keep dreaming and when those dreams disappoint us we grieve their loss we grieve them 
And we grieve things that are horrific, like divorce and rape and emotional or sexual abuse or cancer or infertility or the loss of a dream or suicide or a miscarriage or betrayal. And we sit with those things and we grieve them. And that grieving process might take weeks, months, years. And we might not ever get over that thing. We get through that thing. But there's other things that we need to grieve too because some of us haven't really experienced that. We also need to grieve other things like friends moving away. See, I have, this is a very interesting thing. Um, when, I, when, I first, when we first moved here, my wife and I and a, a team of people to help start this church, I would meet with other pastors from the city and they would tell me, listen, Dave, don't get too attached to people, they'll move. I'm like, oh, really? No, that's not going to happen. Like, people won't leave. Like, they'll stay forever. And um, I'm like, no, for, seriously, like, every two, three years, you just get a whole new church. Like, everyone just moves. And I'm like, that sounds kind of pessimistic. I mean, can we just hope for something better? They're like, you can. Have fun with that. Um, tell me how that works out. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I heard this over and over and over again. And then we start to see it. And we start to realize it. And even in, in our own friendship circles and even in this own church, not everyone, but certain people, they, I mean, they don't leave because they hate us. They leave because their life takes them somewhere else and, and that's okay. But you have to grieve those, and it's hard. And you're like, do I keep getting close to people knowing that they might leave in two years? You thought that too. If you've been here for longer than 10 years, you've had 17 different best friends that lived in the city. Or 17 different roommates that you got really close to. And all of them moved out. And you're going, well, do I keep getting close to people in this city? Because everyone keeps moving. You have to grieve things like friends moving away. Like a loss of financial security. Or you move away from your former relationships or job and you move here. Or you have to grieve the fact that your body doesn't look or act or work the way it once did. And you're getting old. And that's a real thing. I promise you. <laughs> a lot of people don't think about grieving that. At all. They think, never mind, I won't go there. Um, <laughs> leadership changes in your small group or your church or a pet dies. Do you grieve these things? Now, I keep saying that. What is grief? What is grief? Here's a working definition of grief. Grief is deep emotional sorrow and distress over losing somewhat, some cherished thing or person. Grief is deep emotional sorrow. Deep emotional sorrow and distress over losing some cherished thing or person. We don't like grief. If we lose something or something in us dies or a dream dies or our body doesn't look the way it once did, we don't think about we don't think about accepting those things or mourning those things or having emotional sorrow over those things because they're now gone. What we do is we ignore them and they weigh on us. Or we try to fix them and we're just chasing and chasing and chasing something that we know we'll probably never get, but we keep chasing it. Grief is just sitting with it and feeling deep emotional sorrow and inviting God into that thing. So... Before we move on to John chapter 11, we were built for perfection. We live in imperfection, and the world is almost set up for our disappointment, and what we need to do is learn how to grieve. Turn to John chapter 11. In John chapter 11, Jesus is with his disciples, and he gets news that Someone he loves is sick and is probably going to die. Jesus was really close to a family uh, of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And they, were, they were siblings. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Jesus got word that Lazarus was ill. And the word that came to him was, Lord, the one you love is ill. Lazarus was, Jesus was one of Jesus' closest friends. Jesus loved Lazarus. And it, it came to him that Jesus hey, this, this guy that you love has fallen ill. Actually, Jesus loved the whole family, it says in John 11. They were, he was very close to this family. He was there, this family was special to Jesus. And when Jesus heard the news about Lazarus, he delayed a little bit. It seems like Jesus was setting up a miracle. 
was setting up something about who he was, his character, and the fact that he was the resurrection and the life. Because if you know this story, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. I don't hope to give that away, but I, I trust that most of you know that story. Like, dang, why'd you give that away? Okay. Jesus delays, and when Jesus finally arrives, Lazarus has been dead for four days. And first, when Jesus first appears into town, he meets Martha. Now, I don't have this, actually, go away from that. Can you go blank screen? Ah, there you go. Um, let's look at this real quick. Before we move into that, let me, let me read to you how he meets Martha. So he comes down, he finally makes his way into town. It says in verse 17. So if you have your Bible, just, I told you you need your Bible today. You need your Bible every Sunday, people, but today especially. Um, on, look at verse 17. On his arrival of the town that Lazarus was dead in, Jesus found that Lazarus had been, already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. Lazarus has now died. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Look at verse 22, very important. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And so a lot of people believe, commentators believe, scholars believe that what this, what this is here is Martha giving Jesus her faith. It was like, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. You would have done something to keep him alive. But I know now that you're here, God will do anything you ask. I believe that whatever you want to happen will happen. Whatever happens, happens. I believe in you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, she tried to get all theological on him. I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she said, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who came into the world. Now he will go and meet Mary. Now this is what we have on the screen, but you can follow along in your Bible because it's important. Verse 28. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said to Mary, and asking for you. He wants to see you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to Jesus. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there, the tomb of Lazarus. Verse 32, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? I want you to notice a couple things here about grieving. This is a section, ultimately Christ, Jesus will raise Lazarus from the dead. And we, you might know the end of that story. It's the very next section, a very important part of the story. But I want to sit here in verses 28 through 37 with you and just sit in the grief for a second. For this moment of time, when Jesus enters into this everyone grieving, and they had people that came in to comfort Mary and Martha and grieve with them and wail with them, and they were grieving and they were crying, Jesus enters in, and we even see Jesus being, knowing, knowing that he would raise Lazarus from the dead, entering into their grieving process, even grieving himself. But notice a couple things about grief with me. Mary says the same thing that Martha does, but doesn't ask at the end, I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. You notice that? Do you notice that Mary and Martha said the same thing? If you would have been here, my brother would never have died. But notice that Mary doesn't add at the end of it, but I know even now God will do whatever you ask. She just simply says, if you were here, my brother would never have died. The other difference between both of their statements is that in Greek, my brother, when Mary says my brother, it's separated differently in the Greek sentence, meaning the emphasis is on my brother. In, in Martha's sentence, it says, if you, would have, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. But if you read it, Mary's sentence, it would, it, the emphasis is on my brother. 
She's like, if you would not have been here, my brother, my brother would not have died. Not your friend, my brother. Now, why, why this emphasis? What Mary is asking Jesus highlights a deeper resentment that she has in her grief. It highlights this resentment that she has toward Jesus, this resentment she has toward God's will. She was basically saying, why don't you care about me, Lord? Why don't you care about me? Where were you when this was happening? When my brother was suffering and dying, where were you when my brother was dying? One way we can grieve before God in a healthy way is to be honest before God with our emotions. This might be very, very scary for you. To know that God can actually handle your emotions. That you can go before God and sit before God and go, God, when I was being abused, where were you? Where were you when this was happening to me? Where were you when I, 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 when I, I had this great hope and I entered into this relationship and it ended, the, where were you there? In the book, The Cry of the Soul, the authors say, emotions are the cry of the soul. They expose what we are doing with the sorrow of life and in turn reveal what our heart is doing with God. The reason why it's so important that we grow emotionally mature is because emotions are the cry of the soul. Emotions come up some, from some deep, deep place within us and they expose what we are doing with the sorrow of life. What are you doing with the sorrow of your life? What are you doing with all the disappointments that surround you? Let me just try to give, give a guess. If you're an optimist, what you do with the, with the sorrows of life is that you deny them. You move on to your next high, which comes in the form of shopping or music or television or your next work project. You travel. You post another great throwback Thursday picture on Instagram and wait for likes. Something like that. Whenever you experience some great disappointment in your life, if you're a, an optimist, you just deny it and you, go for the, you, you look for something to give you a high. Like that, that, like, that would perk up your, your emotional state. Like what, what does that, oh, shopping, I need to shop. I need to get online, I need to shop. I need to post something on, I need to, I need to tweet something that someone retweets so I know that I'm loved. If you're an optimist, you deny it and you move on. And you try to find that next high. If you're a pessimist, you suppress it. You suppress it deep, deep down and let it taint everything else you see. You say, this person is going to leave me like the last one and so you can't even enter into relationships deeply. Life will never get better. See, the beauty of Lent, the season the church just entered into before Easter is that if you, if you are observing Lent in a, in a, in a healthy way, in a, in a right and true way, what Lent invites us to do is to pull away all the stuff, especially if you're addicted to the highs all around your disappointments. It allows you to pull those things away and deal with what's really there. Um, I asked Julie Barrios, our um, spiritual formation director this week, I said, is, I'm, I'm thinking about this teaching and, and lament, grieving, and Lent. Is there a connection between lament and Lent? And she emailed me this beautiful, beautiful email, and this is part of it. I can't say it better than this, so I'm just going to read it. This is what she said. She said, Lent is a time to relinquish the things that we may not even know we are using to avoid pain. This is why it's common to abstain from food, drink, TV, social media, shopping, dan uh, dating, not dancing, dan dating, not dancing. Don't abstain for dancing. Dating and more. <laughs> we are all using these things in disordered ways. The important part of Lent is that is uh, the important part of Lent that is often misused is that we abstain from these indulgences not to replace them with other things that can give us the little high we need, but we let them go so we can more fully uh, assess the pain, fear, anxiety in our hearts and learn to live with Jesus from that deeper place and allow him to give us comfort. Or not, he sometimes makes us sit there longer than we would like because he is taking us even deeper. What 
Julia is saying, what Lent, and I think I like her perspective on Lent, is that all these things that we use, a lot of people, you know, give up chocolate and drinking and food and television and social, whatever, you, whatever you fast from, this is not so you can go, oh, I'm observing Lent and I'm fasting, whatever. It's actually so you can realize that you, when you go to these things for your little high, you won't sit in pain, you won't sit in disappointment, you won't sit in these things, you go on to the next thing and Lent removes those things from you so you can't go there anymore. Like, oh, I want to, and you can't. And so you have to sit with it. So you sit with disappointment. You sit with sorrow, you sit with your anxiety, you sit with your fear, you sit with your pain, and you sit with it, and you let Christ come in and be your comfort. And he might take a while to get there. He might wait four days, like he did with Lazarus. He might just sit there and go, I'm going to wait. But we're people who, in the process, learn how to grieve. One of the many ways that we can start to grieve loss is by practicing Lent. Not allowing the quick highs we give ourselves to mask the pain we feel, but be honest before God with them. Paul David Tripp wrote a book on grieving called Grief, Finding Hope Again, and in it he writes about expressing our heart to God. And I find this very helpful. He says this, the Bible is honest about the sorrows of life, and God expects you to be honest as well. Psalms 13, 22, 38, 42, 55, 59, 61, 73, 88. Tark will like numbers, so there you go, Tark. All record God's people bringing their honest grief, questions, and complaints to the Lord. You know that most of the Psalms are that? Most of the Psalms are, are the psalmist bringing their complaints, bringing their, 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 their pain to God. He says, you should too. If you are confused, let God know. If you are angry, let God know. If you are sad, let God know. Your faith shouldn't silence you in the midst of your grief, but should be the catalyst for a conversation with your heavenly Father, the very lover of your soul. It's in the honest moments that you'll begin to understand the depths of God's wisdom and love. You see, God doesn't just listen, he also answers. Pour out your grief to him and be honest. There's some things that some of us need to grieve before God. Grief might be a great way to handle the fact that you are of a certain age and your life is not turning out the way you thought it would. You might have thought you'd have a family by now or that you'd be married by now, and you're not. So instead of working overtime and pouring all your life into work, why don't you just stop and grieve the fact that you had hoped that that would be the case right now, but it is not. And if you're angry, tell God you're angry. The beauty of the Psalms is that you have men and women that are honest before God, and it's all in the context of worship. It's all in the context of worship. They were songs to be sung publicly. And these public songs that they were to sing were songs of lament, songs of anger, songs of God, where are you? Why did you do this to us, God? This is what Mary did. She was honest before Jesus with her emotions. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Back to John 11. And then it says this. When Jesus saw her weeping, that is Mary... And the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Some have said that he was angry because of their unbelief. Some have said, well, Jesus, be, he was angry here. And the reason why he was deeply distressed and, and troubled and he moved in, the reason why he was that way because everyone in the story is mourning and crying and they didn't believe that he was the resurrection and the life. That's why he was doing that. I don't believe that for a second. And the reason why I don't believe that is Jesus blesses the grieving and the heartbroken and the Beatitudes. So I can't imagine him getting mad at the heartbroken and the mourning here. Blessed are you who mourn. I can't imagine Jesus cursing the person who's mourning right after he said he blesses them. 
We're told later on that Paul urges us to grieve with those who grieve. That is a biblical, that's a, that's a, that's a, a, a command from us is to grieve with those who grieve. So I can't imagine Jesus being in the midst of those who are grieving. Or it's like, I can't believe you're grieving. Stop grieving. Why was he deeply moved? Why was he troubled in his spirit? This was not anger directed at Mary, but this was shared anguish. Jesus mourned. Jesus grieved. He was in anguish at what the loss at what loss brings to people. What the loss of a of a brother or a sister or a family member or a close friend brings to us. He grieves with us. What the loss of a dream means. He grieves with us. He's deeply moved. Jesus being fully human shared in that. And he couldn't hold back his emotions. And then the shortest, most powerful verse in the New Testament is Jesus wept. One commentator translate that, translates that Jesus bawled. He was so overcome by death and loss that hurts everyone, including himself, that he completely starts to cry and break down. And he asks in verse 34, where have you laid him? This shows the humanity of Jesus. Where is he? His, Jesus' complete humanity. Where did you lay him? And they said, come and see. Come and see where they laid him. And then, as we know, the end of the story, Jesus does raise him from the dead, but not before first he sits with the grief and the loss. See, at the end of Jesus' life, one of the last words he said on the cross was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus died asking our questions. Asking a question that in your disappointment and in your pain and in your loss that you might have asked a hundred times, why have you forsaken me? And you see Jesus on the cross hanging for our sins asking our very questions. He ends his life with a question mark. Why have you forsaken me? And we can look at him on the cross and go, those are my questions. Those are my questions too. And Jesus dies asking our questions. There's a lot of things that I had hoped for in this life. And I won't divulge them in front of this large crowd. I've divulged them and told them to my close community and I've grieved with them over the things. There's a lot of things that I can say I had hoped. And I had hoped this and I had hoped that. And at 35 years old, I had hoped this and I had hoped that. And there's a lot of things I can't do over again and a lot of things that happened in my life that I can't, I can't take back and a lot of things that were done to me that I can't redo. And I can say I had hoped. There's always been a scripture that sticks out to me. It's one of my favorite, favorite single sentences in the Bible. And it's found in Luke chapter 24. Would you turn there real fast with me? And we'll just sit with this for a while after this. Jesus died asking her questions. He was buried. And three days later, there was this rumor going around that his tomb was empty. And in verse 13 in Luke chapter 24, we meet these two guys who were leaving Jerusalem. I have no idea why they were leaving Jerusalem. If they were followers of the way and they had heard that Jesus' tomb was empty, for some reason, they decided to go for a walk and leave. Now, on the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself this is resurrected Jesus Jesus himself came up and walked along with them 
my favorite, the reason why this is my favorite probably section or, you know, stories in scripture, because the fact that Jesus would actually do this is rad. Like these two guys are walking away just so bummed. And Jesus is like, I'm going to go follow them. And he's walking with them. And Jesus doesn't like come out and go, hey, I'm here. He just starts talking. But they were kept from recognizing him. And he asked them, and he just baits them in. It's so funny. He's like, what are you guys discussing together as you guys are walking along? What's going on, guys? How you been? What's, what's, what's up? And they stood still, and their faces were all downcast. So they're walking, and Jesus walks up next to them. Hey, what are you guys talking about? What's going on? What's, what? And they just stopped. They can't even like, I can't even explain this to you and keep walking. You know one of those? They just stopped. They're like, are you kidding me? Like one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem that does not know the things that have happened in the last days? Jesus keeps like agging him on. What? What? What things? What are you, ta- what are you talking about? What? <laughs> and they were just like, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all people. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. That single phrase, we had hoped he was the one. We pinned all our hopes on him and all our dreams on him. And on him wrote everything that we had ever hoped for. And they killed him. And he's dead now. The beautiful part of the story is that they had hoped in many things. And then all of their hopes were now pegged on one person, and their hope died. But in a twist of irony, their hope was standing right next to them. In their grief, in their mourning, in their pain, in them walking away from Jerusalem. Why would you walk away from Jerusalem if his tomb is empty? They just couldn't take it anymore, and they just left. And Jesus walks right up to them, and he goes, we had hoped he was the one. And Jesus is like, I'm here. It's in the midst of their grief. It's in the midst of what they had hoped is where Jesus meets them. And they were honest with each other. They were honest about what they had hoped. And the beautiful thing is that Jesus meets them right there. Right in that moment, their hope that had been dashed is standing right in front of them. And this is, I cannot, I would be, I would, it would be such a disservice to leave us in grief. Meaning, hey, suffer grief, have fun with that, we'll see you guys in a couple weeks. That's not what grief does. You sit in grief with Jesus. And you can be completely honest with him about your fears and your hopes, the things that you had hoped for. And it might be a while might be months and years, but one day your eyes will be open and and realize that Jesus has been there the entire time. And that's what I want to invite you into. I don't don't really think I have three steps to do grief right. I just, I'm not there yet. I just, I think this series calls for and our, and our, where we're at as a church calls for us just to sit in this because this might be new information for many of you. I, I can sit in my grief with God. I can actually tell God how I feel. I can mourn the loss of a relationship. I can mourn the loss of maybe ever having a relationship. Some of us, we're not even there yet. We're like, I can't even do that yet. But if you are, God is willing to sit with you. God is willing to be with you in that point of disappointment. And I don't know if he'll remove that pain right now, but I know he promises to be with us in that pain. God, I thank you that we can grieve with you. I thank you that you can rejoice over us with singing and gladness in the midst of our weeping and pain. I thank you that in you is the resurrection and the life. I 
I thank you that you can resurrect our depression, that you can resurrect our sorrow, that the story of the gospel is that though we die, yet we will live. Help us to live in this world with dreams and hopes and when they don't happen to sit before you and go, we can mourn them, God. But we know it's not a loss of life because our life is in you. And you are risen from the dead. We peg our hope completely upon Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen.